welcome to Marketecture, where you can get smart fast with in-depth interviews of leading technology vendors. I'm Ari Papero. I'm here with Louis David from Confiant. Hello, Ari. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Everyone calls you LD, so thanks yeah, for being here, LD. Do. So before we start, I just want to have a disclosure that I have been a longtime advisor to uh, Confiant back when it was known as Clarity Ads. And I have a very small equity interest in the company. So get that disclosure out of the way. So what is Confiant? I, I went to your website and it says a lot of cool stuff about security and malvertising and all this stuff. But what is it? Yeah, no. So Confiant is the, the world leader at protecting from malvertising. So malvertising is any type of cyber threat that uses ads as a vector. Uh, so to date, we have worked primarily in helping the ad industry protect its uh, supply chain uh, because the uh, the victims that, that get hit by malvertising are users. Uh, and so the uh, users are, are one of the constituents that, that matter to the ad industry. And so publishers and ad tech platforms have been higher and confiant to help give them control over how uh, what the ads are doing on their sites and their pipes. So that was kind of phase one. Phase two that we're entering right now is uh, when we seek to connect the, the data on the attacks that we're detecting and protecting from to people who care even more. Uh, so phase two is about bringing the, this data, layering on threat intelligence on top of it and connecting it to the large enterprises for whom those users are actually clients. Okay, let's talk about the product. I, I guess it would probably be easiest to start with how would you detect the bad stuff, and then go into who buys the product and how they deploy it. So prior to Confiant, everyone in the ad industry, when testing for malware, would just test the ads on using server-side test environments. I create robots, engage with the ad, and get everything uh, about it, or try to, get, try to know everything about it, and then make a determination. Uh, we concluded that that approach was going to be inherently limited because the data set being generated by the, the test environment, by a scanner, is one of the ways to think about it. Uh, the data set would be too easily compromised by the bad actors. And so we set out to build a new technology paradigm. Uh, it took us uh, four years. Uh, the first phase of the business was spent in R&D mode, but then we delivered to the ad industry the first testing system that sat both client side and server side. And so it's the dichotomy between the two, the differential in many ways between the two that that give us the power of our system. So we we're able to detect ads better than anyone else, better detect bad ads better than anyone else in the industry because we look at them both on the client side, integrated into a publisher's website, uh, and we position ourselves post auction but pre render, and then also server side in a in a capacity where we're actually integrating in auction for the SSPs, pre-auction for the DSPs, we really customize our integrations to each specific layer of the industry uh, so as to ensure that we could get accurate data because there is no playing the security game without accurate data. Right. So what? Uh, give an example of why server-side alone is not sufficient. Sure, because if the, uh, so the bad actor is able to run code within their ad that detects whether they're running against a real person or a fake environment, and there is no technical way to create a perfect fake environment. There's always going to be some edge case that if the bad actor goes looking for it, they will be able to detect that it's a not human. Uh, and so as an example, one of the things that we, we've we uh, seen very regularly over the years is, well, when uh, mobile became very big, the bad actors would start checking, is there are there all the APIs available that are available when you're on a mobile phone? And so then it's a question, did the test environment get built completely or not? The minute the test environment started having all the APIs, i.e. when the, the, the protectors started saying, oh, wait, they're testing for this, we've got to emulate it, then the bad actors started checking, well, all right, are the APIs accessible? Do they return data? And then the minute the API started returning data, they then started testing, is the data being returned by the API oscillating correctly to reality, or is it just a constant feed? I, there is always going to be a plus one layer that the bad actor is going to be able to go to to, to figure out that the environment is a fake environment, that it's not a, a real person. And the, re and the reason that matters is that the minute they do that, they will hide their behavior and they will hide, more importantly, their infrastructure. So now the domains that are loading, the payload, nothing is loading, and the good actor, the test environment, can't know that. And so therefore, the data set being generated is inaccurate. It is literally wrong. It's saying, hey, 
There were supposed to be 100 domains. It believes 100 domains were loading within this ad, but it actually should have been 120 domains, and they're not seeing all the domains that are tied to the bad actor. Infrastructure. If anything, we actually once saw a campaign where the bad actor, when detecting that they were uh, in a test environment, would hide all their stuff and then load moat.com. I, they were pretending to be a good actor protecting from the bad actors themselves. Right. I just want to dumb it down for people if they don't fully understand what you're saying. Like basically, if you have an ad and you want to see if it's a bad ad and you you write a program to detect that, the bad guys can can kind of debug your program and make the, the ad not do anything bad when it's being tested. Correct. Yep. Right. Yep. And so that was the, the reason that once that data is generated, it doesn't matter how good the algorithms are, how good the detection system is. If you feed bad data into a technology system, the conclusion is going to be bad. It's going to be mm-hmm. incorrect. And so the industry's assumption was that it could brute force this type of approach, that just by generating scale of data, by brute force, you'd be able to smooth out these inaccuracies. And the reality is that that was never the case. Okay, let me I, ask this a really stupid question just because maybe some people watching this have this question. Uh, why can't you just look at the code? Like, why do you have to run the ads? Why Doesn't the code say, like, pop up malware here? And The, uh, the code itself can be obfuscated, and it can also be set up in hops. Uh, and so you have different gates where you don't load the, the actual payload code until XYZ other code is loaded first. And so they can integrate into those codes check bars, and if you don't pass X gate, you never get the uh, you never get the payload. And what are these malware ads doing? Like, what's the who who's making them, and what are they doing? Sure. So the who's making them and who's running them is actually two different groups of people. So it's worth worth noting as well that the attackers that have become experts at hacking the ad industry to get bad ads through, get malvertising through the pipes, are not the same as the people actually originating the payload. So that's already, there's been a, a the, the, the supply chain from a malvertising perspective is sophisticated enough that there is specialization, as is the case in any sophisticated cybersecurity vector. Then in terms of what the malvertising ads are doing, they're A, primarily they're making money. And so how that money is made changes over time. 10 years ago, it was flash exploits, flash ads delivering drive-by downloads and exploit ads. So it was ransomware and malware. That evolved like phase two of malvertising was really focused on JavaScript-based triggers that would trigger a forceful redirect to a phishing scam, i.e. where they were trying to steal personal data. So uh, you want a free Amazon gift card. I'm sure and many people have seen that. That forceful redirects at the time from 2016 up through 2019 were 95% of everything that we saw. Uh, and then in 2019, we started seeing a new type of attack, one that shifted away from JavaScript-based triggers and started focusing more on cloaking specifically. And so today, actually, the market is completely inverted. Uh, 95% of everything we see is uh, financial fraud. Uh, So these are ads used to trick people into fake financial transactions, whether they're interjecting themselves in directly to do credential theft on your bank data or your crypto wallet, or more importantly, if they're trying to pretend to be a legitimate financial investment uh, with a fake celebrity endorsement, fake news article, and then fake returns that you never get when you lose your money to them. Thanks for listening. To hear the complete interview, subscribe at architecture.tv.